so when it does the solve, um, you get a little bit of feedback, you know, so if it's a long solve, it'll, it'll, it'll show the different iterations here as it steps through um, the, the solve. And so you can get a little bit of feedback on its progress, but this one's so easy. It just, it just solved it right away. And there we go. Now we, we, we have a, a helmet that can look at you know, stresses, displacements, you know, wh whatever I want to look at. And, you know, we can cover some of those advanced physics later or whatever, but so we can see, you know, we, we've got some displacement, eight millimeters of displacement, which, you know, it's probably a little much for, for my big melon to, to handle. Even even though my head's so big, you know, eight millimeters might be uh, a little painful for, for me. So in, in the sort of work simulation, we cannot do failure or make things break apart, but uh, with the Abacus and, and the structure mechanics in here, the material set up could include damage and failure. So then I introduce Bruce Lee. Uh, that's his uh, alter ego with the, with the red bandana on the or band on the. Uh, and then I got really excited. I mean, can we break things apart? Let's make a, a cooler with you. And this was kind of my first run uh, at having some metal at some hole. Yeah. So yeah. over here we're seeing. Uh, a ball going through multiple sheet metal pods, uh, seeing yeah. if it's going to reach Bruce or not. Yeah, yeah. What are some of the biggest challenges there um, in terms of testing? I I'm sure, I'm sure it must be be costly in some sense, given your your products. Yeah, uh, the first steps for our designs um, starts with our designers. The, mm -hmm. the designers starts with uh, some sketches, some parts, some uh, assemblies. And when they finish the the, uh, the first conception of the of the parts, uh, that design comes to us. Uh, we're the analyst of the of the area, and uh, we start with um, uh, some initial tests about uh, self weight and maybe critical positions of the of the components and some interactions maybe with rocks maybe with uh, uh, the driller and then uh, in a in a later steps uh, we start with some um, more complex uh, kind of studies like uh, vibration because the driller or maybe uh, some uh, oscillations uh, in the movement of our equip of our equipment, or maybe some uh, fatigue uh, cases that we can uh, see in a, in a real operation of the machine. So uh, uh, that uh, those are our main kind of analysis. Hey, SOLIDWORKS community, welcome to SOLIDWORKS Live. You know, so when I think about the, the prospect of the title of this episode, which I'm sure you saw was Mastering Simulation, you know, the phrase that's listed on the thumbnail of the episode and the title, uh, you saw it probably uh, even in the intro uh, to the episode, the countdown rather, it, it should feel fairly daunting, right? Just, just the idea of mastering anything. But to me, whether it's mastering simulation or it's mastering, again, anything at all almost, uh, it, it might start off with questioning yourself on, you know, what are the the tools available to me? Um, things like what are their respective capabilities? Who uses these tools and how effective do they use them and and why do they use them? So, you know, keeping true to, I guess, the inferred promise really of, of the episode, that's what we're going to look to accomplish together today within this Mastering Simulation episode of SOLIDWORKS Live. So we're going to look at the latest and greatest technology from SOLIDWORKS and DESO System as we head into 2024 when it comes to all things simulation. So that means across the gamut, right? That's that's all things linear and nonlinear, static and dynamic, spanning uh, structural, durability, fluids, uh, airflow, electromagnetics, and, and more. So we're gonna have you covered across all of those bases here today on live. And everything, and this is really important, this next part, everything that you're going to see today, it applies directly to SOLIDWORKS 3D CAD. So we know, 
you know, you're watching on the SolidWorks YouTube channel. Many of you are here because you're SolidWorks users, right? So we just want to make extra sure that everything you're sh you're seeing today applies to your SolidWorks parts, your SolidWorks assemblies that you create, which eventually become, of course, your your products, right? So let's let's get going. Let's 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 kick it off. Uh, no more talking, right? Let's let's check out some cool demos and see some of the latest use cases from around the world. Uh, so to kick us off with an overview of the simulation tools landscape overall and a look at what's new in SolidWorks simulation in 2024, I'm going to welcome on our first subject matter expert and uh, one of my newer teammates, actually. Uh, Ronnie, what's going on, man? Hey, man. Hey, Sean. Thank you for having me, man. How's it going? It's good. So, uh, you know, going off of what I just said, I wanted to start off uh, not with a question, but with an apology. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry that you were not on, uh, I guess, our last official SolidWorks Live episode pre-Slug Me, which was the What's New in SolidWorks 2024 episode. If, if you guys watch that episode, uh, you know this. If you did not, you can go on YouTube right now. Uh, most of what that episode was dedicated to covering was really the core essentials of what you would think of as SolidWorks, right? Which is, of course, first and foremost, it is a tremendous, it's an industry leading, in fact, 3D modeling package, right? So your parts, your assemblies, your drawings, uh, user experience, as well as, you know, if you buy SolidWorks today, cloud services, a lot of that was there. Uh, thousands of you watched that. You can go back on YouTube today and and watch. But uh, for you, Ronnie, again, I just wanted to to apologize because we didn't, we weren't able to get to uh, simulation in that episode. It's uh, all good, man. We were having serious FOMO. Like we were like, you know, all the cloud scene was like, hey, we need to be up there, you know. But, uh, you know, thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity right now. So we really appreciate it. Absolutely, man. Um, but that that isn't to say, by the way, that you were not busy. You were very hard at work during. I like to to remind everyone that's, that's watching here uh, that we we spend months. We spend months not only making the demos for the new software, but also working with the feature customer. Right. So this year it was Bowhead Corporation. They make the amazing adaptive bicycles that no doubt you guys have seen of course, on live, but also in our marketing materials on social. Of course, you see it all throughout the episode. Uh, so, and, and you worked a lot, I know, with, the, with their lead engineer, uh, Senka Patil, uh, and you made tons of simulation content, right? Including, uh, including some for we, we, our team, at least we made uh, some content for, for SolidWorks simulation. So, so just, just, you know, talk to us a little bit about uh, what we did there on the simulation front. Absolutely, man. Yeah. First of all, shout out to the Bowhead team, you know, uh, especially Sankit. I think I called him at all odd hours to you know get answers from him. So he was fantastic. So I really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, with the you know, so let's uh, uh, let me show you what we did with that uh, you know with the with, with the bowhead tool. So Sean, we were able to take a look at this assembly as a whole, as well as like kind of focus on different areas of the design uh, using the multi physics you know uh, options that we have on our cloud simulation. So. Um, and since we were working on the platform, you know, we, we, we took, a, we were able to take a, uh, take advantage of the governance and the shares and the markups tools that we have, uh, as well that come along with it. That way I was able to organize my, you know, the simulations that I needed to run in. And, uh, I, ne I had a better idea of what my priorities were. So very, it was an organizational tool that helped me. So we started by looking at just like the swing arm, you know, I wanted to make sure that this can, uh, you know, withstand the forces and the stresses that it's going to go through. So we started with a basic simulation, static simulation, where, you know, we defined some uh, materials. Uh, I was able to define some like, you know, boundary conditions, apply some, you know, forces, apply some loads and then run the study. Uh, that gave me insight on, you know, whether this swing arm will be able to withstand the forces that it goes through. I was able to take a look, take a look at factor of safety and see that it's going to be fine. But why stop there? That's just a static study, right? I want to see what, uh, how dynamic, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, random vibration affects this swing arm as well. So I was able to create a random vibration study and look at some, you know, uh, define a PSD curve, look at some stress and displacement results. I was like, okay, yeah, you know, I know this is kind of working out and I, I, it gives me a good idea to move forward or not. So, um, so that's structural, right? And when we're talking about structural, Sean, we're not just talking about the strength. We also want to take a look at how long something can last. What's the lifespan of it? So that's where we used, you know, the durability and mechanics engineer in this articulation bracket. Uh, we again, like, you know, used uh, the material database and we used the material with the fatigue data. We applied some boundary conditions, applied some loads and defined fatigue loading, you know, if it was fully reversed, reversed, depending on, you know, the real world case scenarios. 
And right away, I could take a look at you know, my log of life results and take a look at that this particular bracket is not going to last uh, too many cycles. And since we've got collaboration with SolarWorks, I popped it into SolarWorks, made a design change, made a part a little bit thick, reran the analysis, and then I got to compare the two different results from before and after. And I could tell uh, my log of life went from 2.38 to 7.10, which is in the million cycles, you know. So I was able to take, uh, you know, just looking at the structural aspects of it, you know, kind of uh, look at different areas and uh, and improve them uh, per se. But, you know, Sean, like the, the portfolio that we have, the multi-physics simulation domain that we have, just doesn't, doesn't stop at, uh, you know, uh, at just uh, dynamics or structural, you know, we've got fluids, we've got electromagnetics, and even in structural, we've got uh, explicit dynamics, you know. I wanted to take a look at the whole assembly model, and I want to see, like, you know, if I'm uh, rolling down the hill at 30 miles an hour and ever crash into a tree, what happens, you know? So that is a very high-level simulation, and you can't do that in, like, you know, uh, um, you need a very high-level solver to solve those type of analysis. So we were able to kind of do all of that. So that, that'll be coming soon. I wanted to show everybody, like, you know, eventually, you know, when the content comes out. But yeah, man, it's, uh, you know, our uh, simulation tools are, uh, you know, the multi-physics simulation domain is pretty massive. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it gives gives us a lot of insight on, like, you know, how design works and how we can improve the designs before getting it manufactured. So, yeah. It's huge. I, I think working with working with Bowhead, um, and even even Bowhead, like, I, we we have we have team members that I pretty much cover here. Uh, it's all works on our team. We have team members that are covering all different products, right? Uh, just to make sure you guys have access to the latest and greatest, you know, sort of information on how the products work and function. Um, you know, they're, they're even kind of expanding with what they're doing. Um, even since uh, when we went out there in May to take a lot of that footage, um, I think they've started using uh, three sculptor, which is a design role. Uh, they're, they're looking at using that. Um, and a lot of the, I know for you, like a lot of the research and conversation, like you said, these aren't just theoretical problems, right? These are, these are problems that whether, you know, Christian and team, they're actually doing testing. But but even if they're not you know testing it, it, realistically these are things that their customers will have to will have to worry about. So it kind of behooves them to begin looking at new uh, new ways of of looking into verifying you know how their products you know function and whether like you said sometimes it's an adaptive bicycle right if if, if you're designing something uh, kind of in a very broad uh, based uh, sort of transportation uh, level uh, yeah. industry or if it's something else right there there are so many different use cases for for simulation, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, a lot of people, when they think of SOLIDWORKS and simulation, they, of course, they think of SOLIDWORKS simulation, which a lot of designers, as, as we well know, uh, we've been around for a while, right, um, have gotten a lot of use value out of out of that. And we do have content uh, for, even though we didn't show it on the What's New episode of, of SOLIDWORKS Live, we did develop quite a bit of, of content on uh, the SOLIDWORKS simulation. And so could you talk to us a little bit about for the product SOLIDWORKS simulation and, and related products, what's new in SOLIDWORKS 2024? Can we take a look at that? Oh, absolutely, man. Yeah, SOLIDWORKS simulation is a, you know, it has a very soft spot in my heart. I mean, when I started my simulation journey back in the day was with this tool. Uh, and then 2024, we've got a few different, like, you know, cool enhancements. Uh, let's start with the, you know, batch manager. Now you have the ability of running your studies in the back. You get to define, you know, X amount of CPUs you can give it and while still being productive in the day-to-day, -day, you know, work environment. Uh, so that's your first. Uh, now you have an option of injection location advisor. So that was always there, but now it'll give you more than one injection locations if it's uh, optimal over there. So that's pretty neat. Um, copying FES studies was always there, Sean, but now you have the ability to remove mesh and results. So you can rerun if you want to change your mesh and things like that. Uh, but with the, this is one of the uh, major ones. You know, the bearing connectors is now, uh, you know, they've added this distributed connection type, which is a lot more realistic, uh, you know, when, when you're uh, running these types of analysis. So, you know, few enhancements, but like, you know, Sean, going back to like last 10 years, when I started working at Simulate with, with the desktop tools from 10 years till now, like the mm -hmm. amount of growth that these tools have done is, is tremendous. And, uh, you know, I would really encourage our viewers and all the, um, you know, uh, simulation engineers that use these tools, please send us enhancement requests. Please reach out to your VARs. And if there's some functionality that you would like to see that's not there, send send us an enhancement request. We The more we get that, the better, you know, chances of that kind of functionality to, to jump on the software in the next coming years. But uh, I would highly recommend that, you know. it's um, So, yeah, so great enhancements for uh, SOLIDWORKS simulation as well, man. 
Awesome. I'm uh, just checking out the chat. I saw Peter, Peter uh, who will be on the episode later to talk about electromagnetic simulation. Just checked in to say hello on the YouTube live chat. So once again, just a reminder, we are live here, uh, you know, currently uh, just to, uh, you know, just to check in with the chat. I see Bar uh, from Michigan. Uh, I see a couple a uh, couple individuals here checking in from India, which is awesome. Uh, we have a global audience today, and that's, that's great. And you know, uh, Rana, just to kind of get back to the show properly, um, you know, one thing I wanted to, to bring up, and I, I always like to bring it up, especially for our newer team members here at SOLIDWORKS, you know, you've been on Live Design a couple of times, so I'm sure our viewers have have seen you. Um, you know, you, you have industry experience. It, you weren't born like working here, right? It's like you have industry experience prior to working at SOLIDWORKS, which informs, I'm sure, a lot of your perspectives, a lot of things you're talking about here. Uh, but actually, your your just your experience right before joining the team here at SolidWorks, which I think you've been here uh, a little over a year now, which is crazy. Uh, which well, under a year, there. almost a year, man. <laughs> almost a year. Uh, so, um, but yeah, it's it time flies, right? Um, but I wanted to ask you about that. So, your your previous role right before joining SolidWorks was actually working in the the medical device industry, right? Right, right, Sean. So, quite a lot of medical device experience, and um, you know, and. And basically feeling the pain of the medical device engineers, like you know, simulation engineers, design engineers in the real world. So, yeah, I spent a lot of years, uh, you know, dealing with vendors and how you need to interact to make sure your work is done. So, yeah, definitely a lot of uh, uh, you know experience there. And one thing is common, and like you know, the way we use these tools and the way we want engineers to use these tools, you know, it's. It's either like, you know, you go the hard route and not use these tools and do product development and, uh, you know, down the road it comes and bites you, or you take advantage of like, you know, these tools and uh, directly from the start, from the start of your product development process and uh, use their help to get to a point where, where you do one or two iterations uh, of, a, of a physical representation and you have a very good product uh, that will last a long time. So yeah, I mean, quite a lot of experience in that. So a lot of that I try to bring in, uh, you know, as I talk to our clients and our viewers, uh, because of the pain that I directly related to, you know. So and and I'm sure like a lot of us can relate to that as well. So yeah, great. Well, look, uh, I mentioned you're a subject matter expert, and we're we're lucky to have those here. But you know, of course, within our simulation tools, you can speak to those superbly well. But also within the scope of your industry experience, if anyone has any questions uh, that are answerable, of course. <laughs> Uh, you know, ask them in the chat about medical devices or about our SIM tools. We are looking at the chat and I'm going to bring you back. Uh, one of the reasons why I brought up this question is because you're going to be back later when we get into plastics, because I know that that holds a place near and dear to your heart, especially because of your experience within medical devices. So you'll, awesome, you'll be man. back, man. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> cool. I'll see you. We'll see you in a bit. Okay. So I promised we would get into, and, and Ronnie, Ronnie just got into a little bit of this as well, the structural and durability based simulation. Uh, I, and I want to start there because that is probably the most commonly discussed and commonly applied uh, type of simulation if you go across domains. So let's let's talk about that. You know, what's being what's available there? What's being developed? And uh, of course, uh, applicably speaking, you know, how are industries across the world using the latest tools here to solve problems and actually make uh, predictable products in the real world? And for that, uh, we want to welcome on uh, welcome on our next subject matter expert, uh, which is Greg. Greg, welcome to SolidWorks Live. Hey, how you doing, Sean? Good, man. Good. I see, uh, good. see your bike there, um, which I wanted to shout out because you guys yeah. on your team, you've you guys have been making a ton of simulation content throughout the year. You know, we're in November now, so I think you guys started right at the beginning of the year with just loads of different looks of how. And I think you use the bicycle and I think the helmet in like each case. Yeah, yeah. So we we have another channel, um, 3D Experience Works. And we're taking a whole project. It's an e-bike, but it's you know just a similar bike. And we're going through lots of different simulations. So as you saw in that uh, the little primer video in the beginning, mm -hmm. the first one is I discuss you know just general how do we create simulations on the platform. And I have a helmet that I use there and did some impact testing for a helmet. And then we go through a whole process of looking at the bike, doing structural simulation, plastic injection, durability, weld fatigue. And then um, on December 13th will be our next session. And we're doing some some motion kind of uh, projects there as well. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're going through the whole gamut. So uh, a lot of stuff to look at for sure. 
that, that's a big part of I, I mentioned to you um, off air, but that's a big part of, of this show, SolidWorks Live, for everyone watching. You know, we, we like mm -hmm. to highlight, we, we make a lot of really in-depth technical content, um, which one thing I'm proud to say is there, there's a lot to be learned, um, even if you don't have the products, uh, you know, not just learning about the products and their capabilities, but just what is the theory that goes goes into some of the studies we're running, why we're defining things the way, the way that we are. So if you're using SOLIDWORKS simulation or you're using any of the products that we're, we're talking about today, you could probably glean a lot from uh, some of this stuff. So whether it's going to yeah. the SOLIDWORKS What's New page or tuning into the, the webinars that Greg's mentioning on simulation with 3D Experience Works, you're, you'll probably get a lot from it. But, um, you know, one of the things that we, like you mentioned in that lead-in, Greg, that we, that we saw was the IASO device, which we really haven't mentioned too much by name yet, but that's right. really where we're going to get to it now, which I believe is uh, like it's like a wearable, um, it, it's a medical device, right? It's a wearable. Yeah, it's like an insulin device. pump, like a wearable insulin pump. Yeah. Yeah, which obviously is 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 hyper relevant, um, just in the scope of right human beings, right? Insulin is is definitely a, a, a pervasively sort of taken drug, um, you know, particularly for those who who have diabetes, um, yeah. you know, but. Uh, I think uh, starting here with with structural uh, structural studies and durability really makes a lot of sense because this is again it's a representative and, and realistic example of what our customers often face with with their products when it comes to testing you know these different facets of of function and performance. So what what can we uh, go into there? Yeah, yeah. So um, I mean, the the thing about simulation is people regard it as like only for the expert users and simulation nowadays you know, the products are such that everybody can use it. You know, you don't have to let it just be for the experts. And so with the insulin pump here, it's very important to obviously design it correctly. We don't want any kind of failures with the mechanisms inside or, or whatever, mm -hmm. but use of the platform, we can take everything that you've designed in SOLIDWORKS and directly bring that into the platform. And so you can reuse all the simulation capabilities in the platform and you know whatever you're trying to simulate there and and still let SOLIDWORKS be your authoring tool. We've got all sorts of dashboard like um, you know we're looking at a simulation here. This is not in the software but these are results that were created in the software that we can publish to like our internal website dashboard for other managers to look at you know, all sorts of different complex simulations that we looked at. And in and, and the, the very end of that image, we saw a, a drop test, right? And explicit, which is normally regarded as a very difficult kind of simulation, the, the tools lead you down the path of being able to create these simulations. And in particular with the platform, you can create templates, right? So if I do a drop test of something over and over and over, I can create a, a template of a drop test and then I can put my new devices in there and I can use different aspects of the software to, to adjust the rotation and adjust the, the, the drop height. And so I just have to set something up kind of like one time, push the button and I can evaluate all these different types of simulations where, you know, if I was to do that in the lab, it'd be extremely, uh, you know, cost prohibitive and, and time yeah. for sure. Yeah. That was, that was one of the things that was, was most, Remarkable to me, I think, when you and I actually we had our our live design episode, which is also viewable on the on the uh, the SolidWorks channel, uh, all about simulating SolidWorks models uh, using you know some of these tools and that that idea of using a template and kind of changing up the study um, using uh, different representations of of the model. I thought that was that that to me was was like a big sticking point. We did this stream, um, you know, months ago, and that, that's something yeah. I I still I still remember. Um, as as being uh, like like we're saying, being pretty pretty remarkable uh, with with the IASO here. Could we could we maybe look at maybe an example of of you know how uh, again if I'm if I'm using SolidWorks, you know some of the some of the yep. primary benefits that SolidWorks users can look forward to, like from a a simulation proper standpoint. You know, one thing uh, even before we get into that, one thing I wanted to point out too is and and I think you've talked about it and and Ronnie's talked about it as well is. You know, with SolidWorks simulation, use that as an example. If we were to export study results, it would be, you know, we'd export them to like a Word doc or something. It wouldn't be super immersive. You couldn't see the kind of res result in, you know, forces or deformation or anything like that. Um, here, like even if you're not in SolidWorks and you're not looking to use Office, which is just basically giving you like little JPEGs, um, yeah. you're going to get like a lot of cool information. Oh, there, there, there's so much that gets stored in there, you know, and I, I'm the world's worst at like organizing things and, and the platform just takes everything and, and organizes it together. 
Um, and one of the great benefits is we can, again, take the SOLIDWORKS file, directly bring that into the platform. And if I need to defeature it, remove some fillets or holes or things like that, I can do those kinds of things on the simulation model and not have to worry about changing my original part. And then I can go about, you know, just creating my, my simulation object, putting my loads and boundary conditions on there, meshing it, and, and do all this kind of stuff directly inside the platform. Um, and you mentioned this concept of representations, and, and that's kind of what I'm talking about there is I can have a model here that's defeatured a little bit, but it's still connected to the SOLIDWORKS file. So if I make any modifications in SOLIDWORKS, that's going to come through here, but it's still going to keep all those simulation related entities in here. Um, and so as we go through building this model for, for the drop test, you know, I'm not quite this fast with the software, but this is, <laughs> you know, um, you know, th this is all the steps to create a drop test, you know, automatic contact detection between the components. We have general contact. And so you don't have to like, you know, create all these relationships between all the different surfaces um, and just just let things behave the, the way they are. Um, and, and this model in particular, you know, there's a, a little piece of um, uh, like a little bag inside that, that contains some mm -hmm. fluid. And so we can actually incorporate some fluid in with the structural model itself. And as we drop it, we can kind of see how the fluid's going to slosh around inside and, and wow. affect the results there as well. So again, it's a very detailed simulation that from a high level seems extremely complex, but um, just with a little bit of user knowledge and, and setup, it's it's not that hard to do. And with our explicit, we have the ability to do cloud computing. So you can send that off to a cloud compute and you know whatever kind of credits you, you have available to it, you can send the solver off to you know, 128 CPUs or, or what have you that may not be on your on your local machine. Um, so it, it's, you know, pr pretty advanced to, to go through. And, and the last step of the video here is going through like a, a simple geometric change and then just kind of kind of updating to compare the, the results. And you mentioned something about um, storing files and storing JPEGs and all of that. When we store a simulation on the platform, we have the ability to store the previous results, the baseline results, mm -hmm. along with the modified results. And so all that information gets connected to that initial simulation so we can compare those side by side. And to be able to do that with JPEGs is awful, right? I mean, like, yeah, you, you have to, like, name things appropriately and just it becomes a, a mess. But the platform just takes care of all that data management for you. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I think when like when you look at videos like the one that you just showed us, of course, it's sped up, but it's kind of just to give you an idea of what it would look like. Of course, not to look at every little option. It's not a training video or anything like that. Right, right, right. You do have that stuff. But, um, you know, one of the things that it also, in addition to all the stuff you just mentioned that it kind of awakens me to is that you're able to have it sort of interoperable with SOLIDWORKS in the ways you want, where it's tying to the model, it's updating and yeah. everything. But Within SOLIDWORKS, if we're running simulation or if we're almost doing anything else, right? If we're within SOLIDWORKS, you're kind of at a computational level, you're kind of tying up your program, right? <laughs> Which is a huge yeah. thing. Like people, I remember when I was doing in a previous role, like we've all, all the previous roles, when I would do tactical support, a lot of times, or even like consulting stuff, like you would find that when we would run studies, right? It would, it would basically, especially if it was something that was, was fairly long, it might run for a course of hours yeah, during yeah. that. That's, that's your solvers license. That's just sort of sitting there, not doing anything when you could theoretically be doing other stuff within that file or within different files. So that's kind of a, kind of a big deal. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I remember, um, you know, in a previous job, you know, I'd be sitting there reading a book and my manager would come by and he's like, Hey, why aren't you working? And I'm like, I am working. My computer's just my locked computer's up busy. solving, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm being billable, I, you know, but, but now I don't have that excuse because I can send it off to the cloud and now I have to sit here and keep working or whatever. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, man. Well, hey, it's, it's always awesome to have you on. Uh, you're, you're one of my, you're one of my favorite on, on camera <laughs> presenters. Uh, I told you that before, but uh, yeah. yeah, man. Um, so yeah, definitely check out Greg and his team's work on the 3D Experience Works channel. Uh, once again, uh, you guys have been going uh, pretty wild on, on the simulation content, and you've been going all year. Again, it's November now, so you can picture how much content you guys could dig yeah. into. And it's all 
available on the on the channel. So definitely check that out. But Greg, thank you so much for jumping on, man. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Sure. So I mentioned to Ronnie that he would be back on, um, you know, to discuss plastics. We've, we've talked structural, we've talked durability studies. Um, let's bring Ronnie back on to to get into a bit of plastics. So All right, you missed me, Sean, huh? I did. It didn't take long. It, 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 didn't, it didn't take long. This is like a power hour of uh, right, simulation, right. which probably is a good title for this episode, actually. It is It is like a power hour of simulation. <laughs> No, so I, I, you know, I wanted to bring you on. I, I know plastics is one of your favorite areas, but not not just from the software standpoint, but again through your previous industry experience uh, within medical devices. And one thing I wanted to ask you about that uh, is, you know, when we think about 3D CAD, one of the most common complaints that we hear about people that you know are just getting into 3D CAD modeling is that they might not have such an idea in terms of manufacturability of what they're creating. You know, many of us can make amazing looking 3D shapes, but if you don't have an idea of how it's manufactured, that can kind of be a problem. Um, so how often did, did the manufacturer ma manufacturability conversation come up during your time in, in the medical device industry? And, you know, when we talk about some of these tools, how can SOLIDWORKS users ensure uh, manufacturability of, of their, their plastic parts today? You know, what, what does that kind of look like here? Absolutely, man. I'd love to give you a little bit of insight. But before I show you what that process looks like, let me talk a little bit about why we're doing yeah, sure. this process as well. You know, that real world industry, you know, experience kind of will, will trinkle a little bit. Um, so, uh, Sean, let's say you're working on an electromechanical uh, medical device, you know, that has okay. plastic components, that's got metal components, got a PCB, it's got electrical components. So there's a lot of different components and there's a lot of different failure modes, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, when you have these failure modes, and especially with a medical device now, because you're dealing with human interaction, it's, it's a lot more stringent. It's a lot more strict, you know. So uh, you want to be able to run these uh, uh, simulations beforehand and, you know, and, and go through your verification and validation study. So let me talk about what, an, uh, what a process looks like, what an ECO process looks like when we talk about, uh, you know, a, a medical device. So let's say you made a model, uh, you know, you made your plastic part and you send it to the, um, to the mold maker to, you know, make a mold out of it. And then uh, they reach out back to you because you didn't think about design for manufacturing. So they're like, hey, it's got a lot of problems. It's got rib issues and this and that. You know, you have to uh, update that. You have to change that. So let me just give you a highlight of what that timeline looks like. So you send an email or whatever, you communicate with the vendor, and uh, that's like a day or two that they get, get back to you with the information uh, that they want you to update. You probably were going to have a meeting about that. So that meeting will take another couple of days. So now without even doing anything, you've you a week is gone like no no work has been done because you need to update the models now you start updating the models so because it's a medical device company you have an eco process which is a very stringent detail it's very strict detail eco process you have to get approvals from all the different departments uh you know manufacturing regulatory engineering everything that can take time man and that's just like one update you're trying to do we're making a small change in the model so it's a manufacturable why are we spending all this time like communicating where with these tools i could have done that analysis beforehand and when i'm giving this model out to the mold maker they already have something that we know it's going to work so yeah that, that was something that yeah. was something even you know part of live right we, we try to just mention uh different areas for deeper investigation right um just content wise stuff we've created uh, we talked about a lot of your simulation content that you created that's available on the solidworks what's the new page on solidworks.com but this is this was a big topic. You had like a whole map, I think, just the whole the whole process basically mapped out at different factors. Like you mentioned, ECO process, like actually mapped out an episode of Live Design. I think it was called a day in the life of an FEA engineer, right? Yeah. yeah, it's and those are valid pain points, man. Like those are those are the things that engineers actually go through on a day to day basis. The communication with the vendors, the parts not working, and mm -hmm. what to do, what are the next steps, and the, all the time that takes, you know. So that's where we get these tools like plastics, you know, and other simulation tools to improve our design. So let me show you what that process for plastics would look like. Sure. Okay. So let's say you've got your SOLIDWORKS design, you know, this is ISM model. Right from the SOLIDWORKS, you know, I can launch my plastics injection application. And, uh, you know, once that pops up, it opens up another window where, you know, I've got my model ready. And on the right hand side, I see the assistant panel. I can use that assistant panel to set up the study easy. You know, we'll start with the part. We'll start with like you know what material we're using it uh, using. So with a an, an inbuilt uh, plastics uh, database of materials, I can select. You know, in this case, we'll just do the PA66 with 30% glass fiber. So I'm able to select that material and then just apply. Um, 
Next step, you know, we want to define what some of the process settings are. So what would be like, you know, let's say the melt temperature, the mold temperature, the ejection temperature. So these things we can keep it, keep it as default, uh, create, uh, you know, our injection locations. Um, this tool gives you an automatic injection location option as well, which is very, very neat. Uh, but if you want to create, you know, a custom one, you can go ahead and just like select anywhere in the model and create your injection location, create the size of it. And uh, and I think that's basically it. The last thing you do is like, you know, make sure your mesh is good to go. You've got uh, uh, enough number of elements across the thickness and then you just kind of run the study, you know, and um, it takes it doesn't take too much to run. And uh, once you have the simulation results out, you can easily take a look at some of the, um, you know, some of the results. So, for example, we're taking a look at the fill simulation right now. This kind of tells me, you know, when this uh, uh, this part, when we shoot plastic through the mold, is it going to fully uh, fully fill or not? You know, if it doesn't fully fill, you're going to get a defective piece and uh, that that won't be good. So here it is. You know, the ease of fill looks pretty green. We're good to go. This part won't have any problems. Uh, we can take a look at some plastic defects. So, for example, wet lines, you know, when the plastic is flowing and it kind of comes and meets together, that's where you'll mm -hmm. see some lines that are being formed. And these uh, these can cause like, you know, uh, this look a little weird and can cause defects as well. So you see how the plastic is kind of coming together in the where the ISO thing is. So you're able to kind of, you know, look at these things look at you know a traps and sink marks and make a valid uh you know um uh, point hey do i need to make any changes to this model or not you know if i need to i can go ahead and do that um if this works this is great so some other uh you know results that we have shown over here you know the, this is a pretty cool a fiber orientation so you, know, you can introduce a polymer into your mold and see you know what direction that fiber orients uh, so you can kind of like make your uh, plastic piece a little bit stronger, you know, more stiff and things like that. Um, we also have the ability to do pack and cool simulation or, uh, you know, let's say a warpage analysis. You know, when the mold cools, when this plastic component cools, it's going to shrink. Uh, you want to understand, Sean, how much it shrinks and uh, so that you can scale that part in SolidWorks. So in real life, when it shrinks, it matches the other pieces and there's a better fit form and function uh, for, uh, for, for the plastic components. So I'm able to run all of the studies, Sean, without having to create a single mold, without having to create a single plastic piece. That's powerful. That's powerful. Yeah. And I know that when I give this, if, if I don't have an in-house plastic mold maker, you know, that's okay. Some of us are very uh, blessed when we have a person that's in-house mm -hmm. that has 30 years of experience that can tell you, hey, don't make the rib that way. Don't make the radius that way. Yeah. But we don't, not of, all of us are lucky that way, you know. With a lot of companies, you don't have that, but you have these tools that can give you the exact same, you know, results and insights on how, what you need to do to improve your plastic parts. It's a huge point. I know it's a huge point in the industry. Um, just talking to talking to different users, and I remember I, I, even even just foreseeably within the last ten to fifteen years having conversations, uh, because like the level of expertise you have in house and the level of personnel you generally have around, that changes a lot. That changes, you know, with regards to. Um, just accessibility of, of personnel, but also just like, what does the workforce look like? What if the skills that have been demanded, look, what if those look like those skills in demand over the past 20 or 30 years? And and how has that affected the industry negatively or positively? Like those right. are in terms of like having that, that resource, like you mentioned in house, you can advise you on whether, you know, based on your design and how it's going to be manufactured, sure. if it's going to work out well or not. And it can, and some people can just tell you right away, right? Cause they, they've kind of gone through uh, learning the hardware, they, they've seen some of the defects happen and they can tell you like, don't do that because of X, Y, and Z. Correct. Um, there were a thousand of molds before to be able to tell you that. Without exactly. the tools, Sean, like for engineers like us, like, you know, that are not in the industry for, you know, more than 30, 40 years, we need these tools to, to get a better product out there. That's, you know, that's uh, pretty straightforward, I guess. So overall, I mean, Ron, it, um, you know, I wanted to ask you before, before you, before you left the episode here, you know, you've you spent a lot of you spent a lot of time, even over the past few months, with a ton of a ton of the tools that we're looking at today. We you know we talked about SolidWorks simulation. I've seen a lot of a lot of 3D experience power tools that launch you know directly from SolidWorks and work with your SolidWorks models, right? You have you have a really interesting viewpoint, right? Uh, you know how how is what we're seeing today? How's it how is it potentially different from what many SolidWorks customers are able to do today, or what they're they're leveraging today and, and why is it important for product developers to like final statement sort of to consider all this stuff as we head into 2024? Oh, absolutely, man. And you know, it's a, it's a great question, Sean. Uh, 
why I think I've already answered why we need this. You know, we were all trying to, you know, as engineers, as product development engineers, we are trying to get the best product out there. And, and also in order to be competitive with our, uh, you know, uh, competitors, we need to get the best That's product huge, yeah. out there in the shortest time possible. That's the main key over there, the less number of iterations, you know, that time is the key. You know, if you, if you, if you can get the product out there in, in quick time, but it's still good, you are a competitor. You're, you know, you're going to get looked at. So you cannot do that without the power of like, you know, industry leading tools such as like, you know, uh, the tools that I showed you. And, uh, and it's just not like what I, uh, I'm not saying that Sean, this is like, you know, we are backed by the industry leading abacus solver. So I'm not making this up. This is like, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, the abacus kind of backs it up. So, you know, we are, uh, we're good on the results that we get. And, uh, you know, I need to understand how, you know, one of the things I say, Sean, like, you know, I want to know what direction I'm going to, if I'm starting something, I need to have an idea. Like if I'm going in the right direction or not. Mm -hmm. Right from the start, if I'm going in the wrong direction or if I don't know a direction that I'm going to, it doesn't really, you know, it, it might take me a long time to kind of swing around and come to the right point, right? Whereas I have tools that can direct me to the right direction. And that's why these are important and saving time and stuff, man. It's huge. So uh, just one more time, uh, head out to solidworks.com slash what's new. Uh, you can see the full duration. I think you had like an eight minute, nine minute deep dive uh, into all of these simulation tools, which you can access from that website. So again, solidworks.com slash what's new, uh, the expand horizon simulation video, as well as if you look in the together uh, theme video, which is sort of more towards the top of that page, you'll see uh, a lot of uh, additional uh, materials for what's new in SolidWorks simulation. So uh, once again, check that out. You can go to that link right there, uh, solidworks.com slash what's new. But Ronnie, uh, once again, really happy your own team and uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll be in, uh, We'll talk about this more as we go, but I'm sure you're going to be at 3D Experience World, right? Oh, yeah. We're going to have some fun, man. We're going to have some barbecue. We're going to have a great <laughs> Some barbecue, some, some, some great sim training content, some hands-on sessions. So Love it. You see how I put barbecue up front there, you know? So I noticed that. <laughs> come and join us at the 3D Experience like I've, World. Like, I've talked so much about plastics and everything. Now I'm really hungry. Uh, Let's so, talk about the real things, food. <laughs> the, re the, real, the really important stuff. So, yeah. nah, man, I appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks for uh, jumping on. Cheers, mate. Yeah. Cheers. All right. So our next guest, speaking of fun stuff, our next guest uh, is one of the more popular, I would say, one of the more popular simulation uh, subject matter experts here. The reason why I say this, in addition to other factors, is because I believe he's been on the largest user group meeting ever or the the year's largest user group meeting. It, it's one of our most popular streams. I'm sure you guys have seen it. Um, it basically it involves, you know, community members from around the globe and technical experts here coming together on a big design project, us usually with some sort of charitable component and Shreyas, who is going to be our next guest here, uh, Shreyas, you, you're usually simulating, uh, it, it can be, uh, something really theoretical or something really practical, uh, related to the build. W what were you doing during the last, uh, this, this latest largest user group meeting ever? What, what was your involvement as a, as a simulation professional there? Oh yeah, we had we first off, thanks for having me, Sean. And, <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, we we had so much fun last month uh, at the largest user group meeting ever. Um, I'm not gonna give too much because I want our audience. If you haven't already, uh, search for you know the uh, SolidWorks largest user group meeting slug me eight event. We we have it um, you know on our YouTube channel. So what I was up to there was uh, we we actually built. Um, um, book lending treehouse, right? And then I was uh, testing it for different uh, real world scenarios and then some not so real world scenarios as well. Uh, and then we had uh, Bruce in action uh, in, in some of those simulation as well. So yeah, feel free to check it out. Uh, super cool, um, you know, capabilities we have uh, today with uh, SolidWorks simulation and with the 3D experience platform. So you'll, you'll uh, hopefully get a glimpse of it. Yeah, it was it was awesome to see. I, there were there were hundreds of you watching that, um, and then of course, like just like almost all of our streams, thousands of people watching uh, after the fact. So, like you mentioned, Treyas, uh, everyone watching, go to the SolidWorks YouTube. You can watch uh, Stuck Me Eight, even if you just want to get to the simulation section, just kind of scrub to that. And it's always it's always good, you know those those sorts of uh, those sorts of examples. I, I've always found them uh, to you know at some point you'll look at an example like that where it's a little bit kind of. Uh, quirky, right? I guess you could say, and you would think, well, uh, no one would ever do this. But it's a, it's a great way to learn uh, about some some actually uh, somewhat practical examples 
that you could translate to actual real world context just by looking at something fun. Um, so there's still something right. about yeah. the eye candy there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. that's absolutely right. Like we uh, we we intend intended to keep it um, you know on a fun fun side, right? Uh, we uh, we actually again I don't want to give too much, but uh, we we did, you know created uh, a simulation, a scenario where uh, you know we model actual hails falling from the sky on the mm -hmm. Uh, you know, book lending treehouse. Now, no one would ever, ever do it, right? But just just <laughs> from a fun point of view, and just uh, to demonstrate the fact that okay, we can we have capabilities, we have technology to model something like uh, you know hails, so or you know, just showing our uh, showing off our explicit solver with uh, you know Bruce kicking a football into the treehouse and so on. So fun stuff. Fun stuff indeed. Well, hey, let, let's uh, let's jump back to the uh, the IASO here. You know, we talked about uh, structural considerations. We talked about plastic uh, manufacturability considerations for the IASO device, as well as uh, the Bowhead RX in in some capacities. And you know how the how the tools uh, offered here at Solvers can help Solvers users and have helped Solvers users across uh, several industries. Actually, you know, sufficiently test their designs for these multiple criteria across different domains, but. Uh, Trace, I wanted to bring you on just to talk about different problems and, uh, I guess, verifications that that our customers need to consider as it relates to uh, fluid flow. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, heading into into twenty twenty four, what can you uh, show us there? Yeah, so uh, let's let's stick with the IASO example and uh, just a quick recap for those of uh, you who are joining um, us within the last, you know, let's say, couple of minutes. So IASO is basically uh, a variable drug injection device that. You know, sits on the patient's body and what it does is actually delivers prescription drug in a meter quantity and um, a specific flow rate whatever is programmed by the doctor uh, now ronit talked about it um, you know greg talked about it uh, and one of the key uh, one of the key points key highlights of this device is that patients can you know move freely and monitor drug uh, delivery uh, related matrix autonomously now, naturally a prime aspect of a device like this is um, uh, to provide the most ideal pump performance for high drug flow efficiency now, in order to do that what the iaso does is uh, it, it has a tiny peristaltic pump in it so what the pump does is it it takes the fluid, takes the drug from a cartridge in the device and then injects it um, into the patient. Now, uh, you, you asked me about problems and challenges. One of the challenges mm -hmm. for anyone who is you know, responsible for designing of this, uh, this particular device or this particular um, 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 pump is how do I optimize different parameters on the, on the pump? So that's where we have our you know, flagship uh, CFD tool on the 3D experience platform, uh, which is the fluid dynamics engineer role. Um, now, what it does is it enables designers and engineers to gain insights um, on flow and thermal uh, related performance, thermal performance of your products, right? Uh, so basically, uh, when it comes to the design of uh, this IASO device, uh, design of the pump of this IASO device, uh, engineers can virtually simulate the operation of the pump and then uh, based on those findings, um, kind of optimize uh, the design parameters to, to, um, to make sure that, uh, and to ensure that the drug delivery performances, drug delivery numbers are um, efficient. Yeah, this a lot of these tools have really impressive capabilities, um, and I, I know I know in the chat, you know, some some of the some of the questions are are around, you know, um, like we're talking about fluid flow, right? And some people are thinking, well, maybe you know, I, I've heard of SolidWorks flow simulation. You know, some of us have heard of it, some of us have used it. Um, going off of the ISO for for just a second, um, you know, can you you know, you talked about this fluid dynamics engineer role, uh, which is the technology we've principally been talking about and showing. Uh, in, in in some examples, but can you can you share some of the key highlights of of the role overall? But then, kind of getting back to my earlier comment, you know what what makes it what makes it different than a, a SolidWorks flow simulation, which of course we as we saw in the what's new content, we continue to develop. Yeah, so um, fluid dynamics engineer, as I mentioned, it's uh, it's available on the three D experience platform, um, and and what it does is basically you know gives you all the capabilities to um, to, to gain more insights uh, for your flow and uh, thermal related problems, right? It's, a, it's an end-to-end -end comprehensive uh, CFD solution that we offer today. Um, and then, you know, 
coming back to your second question, what are some of the key differences between, uh, let's say, SolidWorks flow simulation, flow capabilities in SolidWorks, and Fluid Dynamics Engineer on the platform? Uh, the big one uh, is obviously, you know, uh, the cloud compute on so and SolidWorks scalability option, right? Now, when it comes to um, the number of cores that we get out of the box, with the Fluid Dynamics Engineer, we get 16 cores out of the box, right? Uh, both locally as well as on cloud. Uh, and when it comes to um, you know scalability, you can you know scale up to 250,000 elements per core. And if you can pause the you know slide here or uh, you know pause the video just for a second, you can you know see some of the key highlights kind of listed out. These are these are the top ones. Uh, I obviously talked about solver scalability, um, compute option. Um, and when it comes to you know scaling or when it comes to um, you know cranking up those number of cores, we can go all the way up to 144. So you have multiple configurations available, right from eight to 16 um, to 144 cores. So that's that's obviously the key uh, you know um, highlight or key differentiator between these two uh, tools. But then also superior meshing techniques that will help you. Um, you know, simulate large thermal problems, right? Um, you know, meshing techniques to uh, help you capture some intricate geometric details so that you um, you, you capture the thermal uh, gradients and, you know, pressure drops um, and, and so on so more accurately. And then obviously we, um, we uh, something not quite relevant to the ISO device, but when it comes to external aerodynamics, we have, mm -hmm. Um, specific uh, turbulence models for, you know, uh, flow uh, or let's say a car or an airplane or a drone. A anytime there's a flow, um, you know, flowing over an um, object externally, we qualify it as an external flow and we have, you know, specific dedicated turbulence model that we have developed working with industry experts. Um, you know, over the last uh, many years. And then obviously coming back to drug delivery uh, diffusion and performance, we have uh, NACQ and passive multi-species solver to help us with two-way interaction, uh, absorption modeling, mesh motion, and so many advanced capabilities that uh, we, we don't really have in SolidWorks flow simulation, but, um, you know, we, we have it available in uh, with the Fluid Dynamics Engineer. So it complements well um, to to what we have uh, currently with flow simulation, I find it interesting. You know, within within this device, the ISO, there are a lot of different examples that cross different domains that that, of course, we're exhibiting here on this episode in terms of showing showing you what's available, showing you the capabilities, showing you how different companies tend to actually simulate and test and verify. Uh, yeah, like actually looking at, 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 at turbulence modeling for this device probably isn't as, as relevant unless it's someone that's running, running super, super, super fast. Uh, but, uh, no, of course in the bowhead, for example, we, we do within our what's new page, we have good examples of, of how that might more realistically function. Um, but yeah, coming back to, I, I know talking to you before the show, coming back to the IASO example though, particularly, uh, as it relates to, to fluid flow, like, was there anything else that you wanted to show us? Uh, in terms of you know our viewing audience, right? It's designers, solvers, designers, solvers, users. In terms of how they could benefit from from using this this tool you're showing us. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one thing that you know SolidWorks users, um, designers, engineers can you know certainly benefit from Fluid Dynamics Engineer is uh, you know obviously solving multiple design points because uh, it's it's never about a one-off design, right? You uh, mm -hmm. built on your designs. Uh, keep on building on your designs and then eventually after probably hundreds and thousands of iteration you end up with a uh, you know uh, polished version of of, um, of of your product right so what this tool you know lets you do or in terms of capability what it offers is it lets you work with a fully parametrized solidworks model now mm -hmm. what does that mean well if you have um, you know designs if you have uh, you know specific um, components that are highly parametrized in SolidWorks, you, when you bring the geometries, when you bring the assemblies for flow simulations in 3D Experience Platform, in Fluid Dynamics Engineer, you can get those parameters with them as well. Um, what do we do with the parameters when um, you know simulating? It? Well, first off, like you can create multiple design variables. So design variables can be anything 
Um, so for example, uh, the tube diameter in this case can vary from, let's say, 20 millimeters to 26 millimeters with a step size of uh, one. Now, all of a sudden, you have seven different design iterations. I can do the same for response variables when specifying response variable. Um, now, an example of that would be, okay, I want to keep my mass flow rate within a certain range, within a certain mm -hmm. minimum and maximum range. So that's my response uh, variable um, um, being specified. Or I can say, okay, just minimize my mass flow rate or increase or maximize my pressure drop or something like that. So, so basically, you can set as many design variables as possible. And then you can also uh, specify what your response variables are. And then uh, what happens is, uh, okay, we, we just talked about, you know, one specific uh, design variable, tube diameter. You can have multiple of those. And ultimately, you can, um, you know, also end up having hundreds and thousands of design points that you now want to simulate. Let's say one design point even takes 15 or 20 minutes. Now you're basically looking at, um, you know, hours and days of salt time. So that's where, uh, you know, the cloud compute option come come into picture. You can go all the way up to 144 cores, leverage the, pop, the power of cloud to solve all these design points. And you're probably wondering, okay, I have thousands of design points. How do I kind of post-process all of these? Uh, how do I post-process all these data that is generated? So, you know, the post-processing features that we offer with the Fluid Dynamics Engineer are all within the same user interface, right? Uh, oftentimes, what happens is, okay, you use a specific solver, uh, you use a specific tool for uh, pre-processing, and then completely a different tool for post-processing. That's not the mm -hmm. case anymore, right? With the Fluid Dynamics Engineer, you get all your pre-processing, post-processing, solving capabilities right within a single user interface. So you no more jumping between different user interfaces and so on. Uh, but yeah, coming coming back to you know the benefits that SolidWorks user, users get. Yeah, you can obviously uh, create all these design iterations, all these design points just by specifying you know variables and response variables, um, and and basically simulate them using the power of cloud. So that's that's one of the biggest advantages, um, I, I, I would say. And, and in case of Ayaso, right, we, we obviously can, um, the the video that you saw, obviously we just um, had six design points, seven design points, but then you can uh, end up with hundreds and thousands of those. I, I think the, the, the most significant, at least to me, and I'm sure other people would have different opinions, but one of the most significant um, or I guess compelling um, things that I saw was being able to tie to actual uh, design variables um, and to kind of optimize based on that. I think that's when you talk about tying, you know, your design process into simulation um, that it doesn't, it seems it, you might argue it doesn't actually get uh, realer than that. <laughs> I like guess. Yeah. No, crazy. yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a very good point, right? Because fluid dynamics engineer is a DSO systems product. And obviously, SolidWorks is a DSO systems product. They talk to each other uh, very efficiently. So that's, mm -hmm. again, one of the key highlights as well. Yes, we have all these great capabilities, um, probably a different UI, as you probably also noticed, right, than what SolidWorks is. But because they are within the same umbrella, they, they talk to each other. So it's it's going to be it's going to be a two way street, right? You can you can basically yeah. read your SolidWorks model. Um, in, in probably the most efficient way and then also, um, you know, built on it and then simulate it and analyze all these different design iterations. In terms of, um, and this is, this is another thing I know you and I have talked about before, but in terms of like the, the interplay, you know, a lot of times when we're, when we're looking at a specific domain of simulation, we're really segmented to that domain. But when I look at the capabilities and we saw a little bit of this earlier, you know, I think about uh, potentially the capability taking into consideration the actual material in the IASO's case, right? Like going, going, with that, going back to that, of of the actual tubing, like mm -hmm. you know, structural responses, namely when you're when you're simulating flow in this case, fluid flow, flow, right? Um, you know, saying case in the case of if you're looking at variables, like actually experimenting with different materials of the flexible tubing that that actually delivers, actually carries the the drug, you know, questions like can it, can the stiffness influence the way that the drugs delivered? Uh, what kind of interplay do we do we see there? 
Yeah, so that's a that's a very good question, Sean, because you, you rightly pointed it out that okay, um, we, we we talked about you know optimizing tube diameter, but what about let's say I, I want to optimize um, um, tube material, right? Um, each material can have different stiffnesses. Now, based on how the tube is squeezed by that peri uh, blades of the peristaltic pump. Uh, it might induce a different response structurally, as well as um, you know from a flow point of view, because obviously there's some flow going on, um, 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 or there's some fluid in, in in that tube. So we have something um, very interesting. Now this is not CFD at all, right? So we have uh, what we call the smooth particle hydrodynamics capability uh, with the structures role. Now what I can do with this is. Yes, I can have multiple different iterations of a uh, tube uh, mm -hmm. with different materials. And then with, um, with, with, with the fluid, uh, what I can do is I can use SPH to model the fluid in that is flowing within that tube, right? So now what happens is uh, based on the structural response um, of, of the tube getting squeezed, the fluid um, the, the fluid can behave differently. Mm. So, so imagine like a feedback loop, right? So obviously if you're experimenting or you're just trying out one material, you know how it's going to behave. But then as you sure. ask, right, can I, can I, um, you know, can I experiment with, let's say multiple materials of the tube? Yes, absolutely you can. And the, they're going to exhibit different responses on the fluid. Uh, so so we, we can model the fluid using these SPH particles or smooth particle hydrodynamics. Um, so these are basically, you know, particles um, that, that are acting as fluids. So it helps to capture that two-way fluid structure interaction. But I, I want to, you know, kind of mention and make a quick note here. This is, this is not a... This is not a traditional CFD approach for two-way fluid structure interaction. It's it's more from a structural point mm -hmm. of view that we are modeling the fluid uh, just to understand, okay, how does the structure behave? What is the response that it exhibits? And then how does it kind of impart the response uh, to the flow? And then based on how the flow moves in that tube, um, are there any effects on the structure uh, and how how's that response? So it's it's a loop, um, but yeah, I, I I I didn't mean to go into too much detail, uh, but yeah, that that's something cool we have on, on the structure side as well. I no, I appreciate the detail, and I I know I know everyone watching does as well. I think the reason why I say that is because a lot of times, for example, and this is any piece of software, right? This is any software solution where you look at. An animation, you might have assumed that that was actually simulating the actual fluid flow. But I think computationally understanding um, what is going on under the hood, what is it actually simulating and why, I think yeah. it's huge understanding the the benefit and what's, again, just what's actually going on. Because um, I think a lot of us are curious to, to know about that. So I appreciate it. I'm sure a lot of other people do too. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, Trace, thank you so much for, for jumping on. I'm sure all of us who are heading over to Dallas and in February for 3D Experience World, uh, we'll look forward to hopefully uh, checking out maybe one or more sessions that that you're delivering there. So hey, maybe the next time I'll see you in person is there. So oh uh, yeah, yeah, I'll I'll be in Dallas. Um, I'll be in Dallas. I'm doing a hands-on test drive. So if you want to play around with the software, um, feel free to you know um, sign in for that that particular session. It's uh, it's it's gonna be fun. Sounds good, man. All right, Trace. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for having me, Sean. Yeah. Catch you later. Bye. All right. So last thing I want to dive into with our, our last subject matter expert and our last domain of, of simulation overall uh, that we're that we're covering to understand again it, with that that promise of the episode, mastering simulation, just understanding what's available, what are people using it for and why. I want to dive into uh, what we've seen is one of the most rapidly developing spaces, and that's that's electromagnetic concerns and and optimization. You know, think about uh, pairing your your MCAD, your your data from SolidWorks with electronic components, and understanding the result and impacts, uh, which I, I have a, I have a lot of thoughts on. I know our next guest does as well. Uh, so for for all this and more, let's check in with our our resident subject matter expert on this topic, and that is Peter. Peter, welcome to SolidWorks Live. Hi, Sean. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. So you know, 
you and I have talked about th- about this a couple times, you know, off off air. But you know, back when back when I was consulting in a variety with a variety of 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 SolidWorks customers, and I know uh, you have a lot of experience uh, in this area as well um, on how to you know solve their design and engineering challenges. Uh, let's say even I don't know 10, 15 years ago, like it didn't. It, particularly talking to mechanical engineers and designers, like electromagnetic testing did not seem to come up as often as it does today, right? Um, it, it, why, why is this evolution and, and how is this evolution sort of taking place? So I, I think there's a couple of different aspects to that question that I can answer, but really the reason electromagnetics is such a hot topic today, I would say there's sort of three things driving that, and that would be connectivity, electronics in general, and then also regulations. And I can talk a little bit about all of those. And to start with on the connectivity side, more and more devices need connectivity nowadays to stay innovative and to stay competitive. Things that didn't used to be connected, like your watch, your washing machine, um, smart fridges, things like that, even your car. Um, things are becoming much, much more connected and it's really being becoming a must to have that connectivity, whether it's to cellular networks or Wi-Fi, et cetera. So a lot more of these devices need antennas in them and you need to make sure they perform correctly. But there's also just the general realm of electronics. There's so much electronics in our daily lives and and every piece of electronics out there is getting more and more complicated. So when we look at, at circuit board design, PCB design, and all the components that go into these electronic devices that we use, um, the demands on those devices are getting stronger, uh, higher and higher. So things like uh, components are becoming much more densely placed. We have to, uh, transmission speeds and communication speeds are getting way, way faster and power delivery concerns to to these chips are becoming much, much more complex. So um, we have to make sure that these work and that they work the first time because testing can't really be done until the device is in its final stage. But it's not just the performance of electronics, but also um, regulations around it. So let's talk emissions for a moment. And Sean, how how bad would it be if you walked into your living room with your cell phone and your your TV went uh, all stage? (laughs) I wouldn't enjoy that very much. No, exactly. And and nobody would, but but that's a potential with any of these, these electronic devices. And that's why the FCC, at least in the US, has regulations around this. Every device has regulations on how much it can emit and how many emissions or how much emissions it needs to be able to absorb without uh, affecting operations. So there's that. But now with things like wearables, when we're talking about the EASO device or things like smartwatches, there's also human radiation concerns as mm-hmm. well. How much, and the FCC does have regulations around this around what we call specific absorption rate how much radiation would actually be absorbed by the human body so it's really all of these things the the connectivity electronics and then regulations around emissions and uh, human safety are all making electromagnetics a really hot topic today yeah that makes that makes perfect sense I know you and I have shared uh, a lot of times on on the MCAT side with with SOLIDWORKS right a lot of times what we would see was when device would be developed, right? There would be, we would we would leave space, of course, for say, what probably was most commonly like a PCB, right? You would leave space for it, or you would, you would sort of model in the extent to which you would, in terms of what you would do within a mechanical CAD system is you would maybe model in the PCB in terms of just like literally just modeling blocks, like rectangles um, and have yeah, that there. That's... But so with that said, like a lot of our audience members being SOLIDWORKS users, they, they may have never actually seen, because like when you think about all the other domains of just different study types that we've discussed today, we've had a lot of those, if not directly within SOLIDWORKS, um, our, our customers have somehow been doing these sorts of studies somehow. Um, we think of like uh, structural studies, uh, durability, right? Um, their electromagnetics, maybe not so much. So can, can we actually just look at a workflow of how like this sort of interoperability between SOLIDWORKS and our electromagnetic simulation tool can actually happen? We definitely can. Let's take a quick look at the IASO device. And this is one specific study. We looked at two things on this. One, which is how the antenna was performing. Mm-hmm. And we got the antenna performing well. But we have to look at, as I mentioned, human exposure compliance here. There's FCC limits on how much radiation this could actually put into the human body. And we can use the bio models included in CST to do that. So, okay, starting right in SOLIDWORKS, I have my design of the IASO. We see that red part in front. That's actually the Bluetooth antenna we're going to be analyzing today. And right from SOLIDWORKS, I can save it to the platform and start an analysis in CST. 
And CSD Studio Suite is the electromagnetics uh, tool that we use here. So again, once this is in here, I now have access to these bio models. And these are fully detailed human bio models with flesh, fat, bone, muscle, and you can actually pose them. In this case, we just need an arm, but if I needed a human body riding a bike, we can do that. I'm just gonna set up a quick field monitor here for measuring what we call specific absorption rate on the model mm -hmm. and uh, on the human body, the arm, and we'll run this now. So using the power of the cloud, I can go in and run this, in this case, on four GPUs and 24 cores at the same time. And once we do that, right within a web browser, I can even pull up the results of this and we can look at the human exposure. So when we look at this, we're going to pull up what we call a specific absorption rate or a SAR plot. And the FCC limits are 1.6 for this. We're over that. So we are putting too much radiation in there. How are we going to fix it? Well, we are going to model an absorber. So right within SOLIDWORKS, you'll see I've modeled this little metal absorber that it's going to sit behind the um, uh, Bluetooth antenna between the antenna and the arm specifically to absorb some of that radiation. But the concern is, even if it does fix that radiation, it might throw off the antenna performance as well. So let's have a quick look. And if we could maybe, uh, we'll go into it. We can see it in CST. There's the absorber. All we're doing now is just saving this out as a, uh, a new study so we can compare the results. And we will rerun this analysis. And I'll have you pause this video uh, if we could when we get to about 218 right here. Um, so right here, we can see we've now brought that absorption from it, it was over that 1.6 limit. Mm -hmm. Now we brought it down well under that limit. So we'll pass that human absorption test. But the issue is by putting this right up against the human arm and putting a big absorber right next to the antenna, we may have thrown off the antenna performance. Mm -hmm. And we can actually check and retune that right now. So if we can start that video playing again, what we'll see, so there we go, our SAR, our specific absorption rate is within limits, but uh, our, our um, frequency performance is actually off range here. And if we look at the dB rating there, it's not very strong. It's about minus seven dB. We need at least minus 10. Well, we can go in and add a matching circuit. And this is actually to tune the impedance of the, uh, the model back to a desired impedance. And this is a neat thing with CST. We can actually go in and add this driving circuitry to our 3D model. Well, boom, now we go, we can see we're right on frequency and we have minus 37 or minus 34 dB as a signal strength. So much better performance there. And now we can add a quick task to just recompute that, uh, that specific absorption rate, because this could change the amount of radiation absorbed. So we'll go in and just quickly check that. So we'll go in and just add another, uh, what we call a post-processing plot here to pull out that power loss density and specific absorption. And we'll see this in one moment. There we go. We're at 1.45 under that FCC limit of 1.6. And again, one of the neat things we can do here, we're now moving into a web browser to compare these results. And we'll just match the color scales here. So we're comparing apples to apples. And we'll hide the devices. And you can see how much better mm -hmm. that absorber and uh, the matching circuit have made the results. Much less radiation absorbed into the human arm. We've now made sure this device is safe to use and the antenna performance is still still um, working correctly so it can still have the connectivity it needs to perform. That was uh, that was really evident. I, I think in terms of all the factors you mentioned, um, connectivity performance, um, and also, I guess, you know, safety and meeting regulations. Um, you know, there's, there's so many factors to consider. Um, you know, again, getting back to the title of the episode, Mastering Simulation, I, I think part of it is understanding, like, why do we, why do you do any of this? Why do we do any of this stuff? Yeah. And it, it's, it's pretty, in that example, it's, it's pretty clear, um, all the sort of factors you're trying to, to solve for. So I think that was, that was an awesome demo, but, um, so Peter, I appreciate that. But I also, before you go, I wanted to shout out, uh, we're getting that time in the year. It, it's the end of the year. We're heading into February, which we all know seasonally that is time for, what was called SolidWorks World is now 3D Experience World, like 3D Experience World 2024 in Dallas. Uh, so we checked in with you, I think, last or this uh, this at, during the previous 3D Experience World uh, to discuss one of your hands-on sessions in simulation. Uh, do you do you have any sessions going on this year or this upcoming uh, I do. instance? And I'm actually really excited for it. We did a really introductory hands-on session on electromagnetics last mm -hmm. year. We just looked at some antenna placement on an excavator. I remember that. Model. Yeah. 
Well, a lot of customers do face the same challenges of meeting electromagnetic compliance mm. regulations. So whether that's FCC, if you're in the US or um, other international bodies worldwide, that can be a very common thread. So we're actually doing another hands-on session this year, myself and my colleague, Hassan Shreem, um, specifically around compliance. And we're going to be looking at an e-bike model and actually a uh, basically a bike computer with a, a Bluetooth and a GPS antenna in there we're going to be looking at specifically electromagnetic compliance and passing compliance regulations with that as a hands-on session. But there's actually, I went in to check this morning how many total world simulation sessions there were. There's over 25 wow. this year in every domain. So structures, fluids, motion, plastics, injection molding, electromagnetics. There's a ton of content from lecture style ones to discussions to customer success stories right into hands on workshops like we're doing on the electromagnetic side that's huge that's one area we didn't we didn't touch on uh any motion any kinematic motion today it's one thing we did not get to <laughs> well, there's a couple of great sessions uh happening in dallas this year so i i would say check them out guys awesome and we, we should mention right uh we should mention that over the course of just to try to get as many of you to go as possible right we know traveling to dallas traveling anywhere right that that is a commitment uh, over the course of three days there's a lot of content but to make it a little bit easier, uh, over the course of uh, today, which is November, uh, what is it, November 30th? 30th. Um, and then t tomorrow, which is uh, December 1st, uh, through the next two days, we have an early bird discount actually available. So if you go to 3dexperienceworld.com, you can actually get $300 off your full conference registration. So again, basically over the next two days. Uh, so if you need an extra nudge uh, for your boss, uh, or even yourself, if you're like, I was thinking about going, this is a great time to to register, uh, like like Peter and I are saying. So Peter, thank you so much for jumping on, man. Hey, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me, Sean. For sure. So uh, once again, as Peter mentioned, there's a lot of great stuff uh, across simulation, design, manufacturing, um, you know, data management, there, across every single product and beyond, just talking industry tips and tricks uh, going on at 3D Experience World. So definitely check it out. But uh, in the meantime, we actually have I would say, I would argue potentially over the next, uh, over the coming weeks as we head into the end of the year here, we have, I think, what might be one of our most exciting slates of upcoming live streams. Uh, maybe, uh, let's say, even even just over the course of this year, I, I'm super, super excited about it. So I'm going to actually uh, just, just show my screen here uh, as a feed. So there you go. Uh, so these uh so we actually we just did mastering simulation right that's the episode that we're on right now you can watch that in replay if you wanted to go back uh, or if you wanted to share it with uh with a colleague but these streams coming up uh these are all going on through the end of the year so we have some really exciting live design episodes so coming up tomorrow actually the one i'm cursing over uh learn design intent and style works now live design is a little bit different from live Live design is all about literally just someone sharing their screen, going into SolidWorks and showing you exactly how they uh, are doing the thing that they purport to do. So Mike Sandy will be our presenter, and he's going to teach you all about design intent in SolidWorks, which, you know, I mentioned it a couple of times within this episode of, of a Mastering Simulation that this this episode that's coming up of Live Design is very similar in the way that even if you're not using these exact tools, you're going to learn something. Um, regardless of whether you're using X Design or if you're using SOLIDWORKS 3D CAD, for example, there are a lot of just general design principles that you will pick up, I know, from this episode. And Mike Sandy, if you don't know, Mike Sandy's been on SOLIDWORKS Live uh, a number of times. And a lot of the design, you know, new feature examples that you see on the What's New website, a lot of those actually were developed by Mike Sandy. So Mike's been using SOLIDWORKS for quite some time. So definitely check that out tomorrow. That's going to be happening at 12 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and then uh, we have an episode of Manufacturing Live coming up on the 5th of December. And you can see all the times in, in your local geography there uh, to talk about AI. So we have uh, Fernando Garcia, who's a sales manager at Arizona CNC. He's going to be coming up, uh, like you can see here, talking about the effect that AI and robotics uh, have on, on the industry. So Manufacturing Live is kind of like a talk show. Uh, and you get to hear industry voices uh, within the manufacturing sphere. So definitely, definitely check that out. And then next week, uh, this uh, next Friday, so uh, December 8th, we're actually going to have uh, a YouTube superstar on. So uh, 14 million subscribers, uh, secret lightsaber design tricks in SolidWorks. Uh, so Bogdan from The Hacksmith, 
Uh, if you've watched the Hacksmith before, they make crazy lightsabers, not just designed in SolidWorks, but they actually make them like 4,000 degree plasma sabers. Uh, as you can see, Bogdan uh, is holding there. He's going to show you his SolidWorks screen. And even if you're not into lightsaber design, if you just want to learn something, he told me he's going to go through a lot of how he uses equations in SolidWorks, configurations, uh, how he uses less often, uh, less often used features like the Flex tool, if you've never used that uh, for bending operations. So that's going to be a magnificent episode. Um, you know, lightsabers are always interesting to, to look at, uh, but to see how they design them and build them um, and also take some translatable SOLIDWORKS knowledge, I think will be well worth your while. And then the last one I want to push uh, is happening on December 14th. That'll probably be our last stream of the calendar year. But, you know, if you're not sold based on our descriptions of 3D Experience World within this stream, uh, definitely check that out. We're going to look to have several presenters on who will be giving special sneak peeks of their training sessions uh, for 3D Experience World, which will only be happening in Dallas in February. So once again, if you're not sold uh, by that time, that you should definitely come to Dallas to take in all the SOLIDWORKS content, all the simulation content, uh, training-wise, all the hands-on, uh, all the networking that we've been talking about. Uh, tune in or have your boss tune in uh, to that episode, uh, which will be happening 12-14, uh, December 14th uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern. So definitely check it out. Once again, thank you to all of our guests, all the subject matter experts. Thank you to our, our, our production team uh, for, for running this episode. We had a whole lot to show everyone. And thank you all for, for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe, and we will see you soon. Take care.